Today's message is for messed up people. A lot of us need a, a message that's for messed up people. And maybe you do too. Maybe you're listening to this message at home feeling lonely because you, you messed up your relationship. Maybe you know the feel of a prison mattress because you're listening to this from behind bars. Maybe you know the name of your parole officer or the people at your support group because you've given in to an addiction how many times? Maybe you know how messed up it is to have anger as part of your character or insecurity or worry that you too have let these sins become part of you and, and now you just, you don't know how to escape it. It's just what you do and it just feels like who you are. In so many ways, because of our sin and weakness, things get messed up. And so here's my question for you today. What do you do, you personally, what do you do when it's messed up? Where do you go when it feels hopeless and your heart is, is hungry for hope? Well, today I want to suggest an answer. That when things are messed up, you should listen to Lamentations. There's this little book in the Bible, tucked away in the big prophetic books of the Old Testament that maybe you've never read or maybe you haven't read in a very long time. The book of Lamentations is this moving emotional poetry by the prophet Jeremiah. And in that book, he tells us exactly what to do when our hope is gone, when things are messed up. In fact, in the section of scripture I'm about to read to you, we find the truth about our faith that I love. <laughs> I love more than anything in the world. The truth I think about a thousand days in a row and it gives me hope when, when I feel like hope is gone. So today, we're going to listen to Lamentations and we're going to hear a message for messy people and messed up lives. So, if you have your Bible at home or just want to follow along with me, let, let's start in Lamentations chapter 3 with verse 18. Jeremiah says this, So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Now, Jeremiah wasn't just being dramatic because he had just lived through this. This next picture is a depiction of what happened in the city of Jerusalem. I believe this specific picture depicts when the Romans conquered the city. But in Jeremiah's day, the same thing happened with King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. What happened in 586 BC when Jerusalem fell, what Jeremiah himself witnessed, was lamentable. Prophets and priests, the leaders of the church, they staggered around the streets of Jerusalem covered in their and other people's blood. After a long siege, famine had ravaged the city, starving even little children down to skin and bones, and they quietly died in their parents' arms. Even the king in Jerusalem, King Zedekiah, couldn't escape and he couldn't help. He tried to flee from the city, maybe to get back up, but he was captured by Nebuchadnezzar and forced to watch the brutal massacre of his own children. Then Nebuchadnezzar gouged out both of Zedekiah's eyes, bound him like a slave, and dragged him off to a foreign land. And there was nothing to do but remember. Remember what used to be. Remember the temple that used to stand. 
remember the king that used to protect, remember the life that we used to have. When Jeremiah looked around, he wept as he lamented all that he had lost. Have you ever felt like that? Obviously, you and I haven't been through the exact same situation, but have you ever just sat down and wept at what's no longer here? Have you ever looked back on your story and realized that if things had been different, if you had chosen differently, maybe today would be radically different. Maybe some of you feel that way when it comes to your health. You know, your cabinet is just a cluttered mess of pills that you pop every day. You deal with the dosage and its side effects. You schedule surgeries and doctors visit. Your body aches and it hurts. And, and you realize it's, it's kind of your fault. It wasn't just getting older. This doesn't happen to everyone. What happened is that you thought your body was a joke. You passed the salt, you downed the sugar, you had the biggest piece of pie, and you laughed like there was no consequence. You sat on the couch, you skipped your workouts, you abused this temple that God had given to you, and, and now it caught up to you. And your heart's not healthy, and your, your muscles aren't strong, and, and there's no way to fix it. There's no doctor that can snap her fingers. There's no pill that you can pop and feel better. This is your life and this might be your fault. Or maybe you think of the relationships in your life. How different they could be. If you had just been able to let that thing go instead of letting bitterness grow, if you hadn't been pursuing your goals and dreams and had selflessly served people and kept in touch, you know, your, your family could have been like that family, but, but it's not. You're, you're distant. You've drifted. Words have been said that you can't take back. The trust is gone and, and there's no like family gathering that can just make it come back. This is your family and this is your life. And there's no rewind button. When you're like Jeremiah after the fall of Jerusalem and you just look around and you remember the affliction, the wandering, the, the bitterness, when you can't forget and your soul is downcast, what, what do you do? Well, today I, I want to encourage you to do what Jeremiah did. I want you to listen to these epic verses from the book of Lamentations. Here's what he says next. Verse 21. Yet, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Ooh, how did Jeremiah manage his mess? Yet, this I call to mind, he said. When his soul felt like it was squeezed out of every drop of joy and hope, he called this to mind. He forced his depressed heart to think about this. So, what's the this? <laughs> this is God. Jeremiah lists these qualities or attributes of what God is like. And it gives him hope. As he sits there in the mess that he made, he forces himself to think the kind of God that he believes in, the kind of faith that he's holding on to. And he says this, verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. <laughs> like just when you think God is going to consume you and condemn you to hell, what do you see? God's great love. Not just his love, 
Not even his good love. No, Jeremiah says his great love, his mercy, his grace for us. The the kind of love that you look up expecting to see God's angry face and instead it's smiling upon you and shining upon you, giving you his blessing. When you messed everything up and you look up expecting condemnation and there is only the cross that offers salvation, you have hope. Or Jeremiah continues, for God's compassions never fail. Just when you think God is going to be fed up and frustrated and done with you, you you find out that he is the kind of father whose compassion never fails. When you've been the rebellious kid and you run into your room and you bury your face in your pillow and you can't even look him in the eye, God is like the compassionate dad who sits on the edge of the bed and just puts his hand in your hair and he's just there. He doesn't stop caring. He refuses to quit loving. His compassion never fails, even when we do. In fact, Jeremiah says, God's compassions are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. On those mornings when you wake up and and you just know, you, you can remember the things you said and did and you haven't been faithful. God still is. As the sun comes up, so does his compassion, his faithfulness, and his love. And when we call that to mind, stop just looking at ourselves and our sin, but we fix our eyes on the object of our faith, on God, the God who died on the cross. We have hope. I wonder if you've ever felt the incredible mercy and compassion of God. Like for some of you listening right now, maybe you never have. Maybe you've always thought of God as the the Lord of the contract. You know, you live a nice Christian life and then he's going to like you. And, And you've never really realized the good news of the Christian faith. That God's love reaches down to the bottom. It reaches into the jail cell, into the prison. It goes into the bedrooms of people who are lonely because they've messed up relationships. It it reaches out to addicts in recovery groups and those who are so scared they haven't even gone yet. Maybe this could be the day when for the first time in your life, the son of God's great love rises and you feel the warmth of his compassion. Seriously, this could be the day. Angels are literally leaning forward right now thinking about you if you would repent and believe. If you would open up your hands and confess the mess, Jesus' broom would clean it all up and bring you to God. And you would see how great his love and his faithfulness really are. But maybe some of you already knew that. Maybe you are a Christian and you know that you're saved, but have you personally ever felt how fresh and how new the compassion of God can be? There's a a story that I told a few years ago, a true story of an elderly Christian woman who was battling Alzheimer's. And she would forget about Jesus. She could still remember that there was a God and she could definitely remember some of the things that she had done in her life. And she could never forget some of those hellfire sermons of her childhood. And and so every morning when she would wake up, she would panic. She would assume that her life was too messy, that, that she was too messed up for God to love or to save. She thought she'd never make it to heaven but be condemned to hell. But there in her care facility was a Christian nurse who knew her. A faithful woman who had been there the day that this woman moved in and put that cross of Jesus up above her bed. And so every morning, part of the nurse's routine was to remind this woman of mercy. To point to that cross that she herself had put up, that that she had believed in but forgotten. 
that there is a father of compassion and a God of incredible love. And when the old woman heard that news, she would smile. And the gospel that she had known for so long felt new and it felt fresh. And some of you know exactly what that's like. You know, it's not that the fact that Jesus died on the cross that's new to you, but, but some mornings, doesn't it, doesn't it feel that way? When you wake up and you immediately remember that you've messed up, how much you drank last night, the thing you said to your, your kids in the, the moment of frustration and anger, the stupid argument you got into with your spouse, it just, it makes no sense the, the morning after and you feel the bitterness of your own sin. But then you wake up to mercy. Maybe it's the song that you play on your phone or that happens to come on Christian radio that reminds you of the love of God. Maybe it's that morning devotion or the podcast from the pastor who, who somehow like knew exactly what you were feeling and reminds you that there is a Jesus. So that even though our sin is great, his mercy is so much more. Have you ever felt that? How many mornings have I, I just felt like a spiritual loser and then the gospel comes back into my mind and I think about Jesus and the depth of his love and hope comes back. And the sun rises in our hearts and we remember that God's compassions never fail. They are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. Oh, brothers and sisters, do you see what happens when we call this God to mind, it, it gives us hope. In fact, if you call God to your mind right now, you just might end up like Jeremiah did. Our last verse for today is verse 24. My favorite words where he says this. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. The Lord is my, what I keep saying to myself, what I refuse to let my emotional heart forget is that the Lord is my portion. My portion, my, my lot in life, my slice of the pie, the hand that I'm dealt, what I get because of Jesus is God. Man, I, I hope that you don't forget that. I did. But I refuse to today. I actually brought something for show and tell today. A binder from my old days in pastor grad school. This right here <laughs> is a binder from just one class that I took, my, my doctrine or dogmatics class at seminary. And inside this binder are all these little tabs and all these hundreds and hundreds of pages of teachings and passages that we had to really study before we could become pastors. The class actually started with the notes here in the back and worked this way forward. And I wanted to share this because do you know what happened to me when I was a younger Christian? I got so focused on these notes that I forgot about these notes. Here's what I mean. These notes here are about the work of Jesus. These had all the passages about who Jesus was, true God, true man, about his incredible work where he humbled himself on the cross and was raised from the grave, about his role as our prophet, our priest, and our king, you know, how God carried out his plan of salvation. These notes were so, so good and they deserve to be. But I kind of miss these notes. Do you know what these first notes were about? God. My little tabs here say things like the essence of God, the attributes of God, the revelation of God. And for some reason, for so much of my Christian life, I forgot about God. 
I was so grateful that Jesus had forgiven and saved me that when I died, I was going to go to heaven and not to hell. But what I forgot was God. (laughs) In those days, I, I might have subtly disagreed with Jeremiah and thought, the Lord will be my portion one day when I die. But that's not what Jeremiah says. He said, the Lord is my portion. Right now, because of the finished work of Jesus, I have God. And even if I've lost the life that I wanted, even if I've messed up that relationship, my body, my health, my finances, whatever, because of Jesus, things aren't messed up with God. I have him. And he's enough. In fact, that's what I want you to write down our big idea for today. That we have God and God is enough. He is our portion and he can satisfy our soul. So, before I say amen, let me make this really, really practical. How do we do all this? When our soul is downcast and depressed, how do we call God to mind? I want all of you to think about that seriously, but especially I want to speak to those of you who are more emotionally wired. Just a show of hands at home, how many of you consider yourselves pretty emotional people? You know, big-hearted, empathetic, compassionate, you, you cry at least once a month, yeah? Some of you are saying, once a month, like (laughs) every day, pastor. Okay, if you're in a room with more than one person on the count of three, I want you to point to the most emotional person there. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, if if that's you, that is a gift. The prophet Jeremiah and our Savior Jesus were big-hearted, compassionate people. I love the fact that God made you that way. But I just want to warn you today that that can mess with your faith. Sometimes your soul is downcast and in those moments you need to engage your mind. You need to preach facts at your feelings so that you can restore your hope. And I want to leave you today with the next step on exactly how you can do that. I want you to keep the faith by repeating all these things that we have come to know about God. We're right in the middle of this message series but here's what I hope to teach you before this is all done. I want you to call to mind that God can, God cares, God controls, God knows, God's near, God's enough, and God endures. Okay, you've heard some of those things already. God can, cares, controls, knows, near, he's enough, and he endures. And I know that's seven things to remember, (laughs) and that's a lot of things to remember. So let's practice together. Ready? Say this with me. God can, God cares, God controls, God knows, God's near, God's enough, God endures. One more time, when when we lament what we've lost, let's say to ourselves, but God can, God cares, God controls, God knows, God's near, God's enough, and God endures. And the more you put that truth in your heart, the more you can stop lamenting and start rejoicing that you still have God. And if you do, you might end up like her. I want to show you one last picture today from one of my favorite Christian artists. It looks like this. I love how this picture depicts life. It can be dark and difficult. It's not easy terrain. But for those who call God to mind, we have this unique light that we see Jesus is with us and because Jesus died for us, we have God and that's enough. And even in the middle of our lamentation, we remember, but because of his great love, we are not consumed. His compassions never fail and great is his faithfulness. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, believer, you have God and God is enough. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we worship you today. 
we remember that you are a glorious God. You are not small and insufficient. You are all that we need to be content. So open the eyes of our heart. <laughs> Help us to remember not just our sin, but to remember your glory. To know that you are with us and you've promised to never leave or forsake us. You're all that we need. Help us to remember that truth, that we could rejoice today. We ask this all in the name of your Son, our amazing Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't it feel like we've been dealing with crisis after crisis in our country? From a global pandemic that's not going away to tension and questions of justice that rile us up and don't have easy answers. It feels like more than ever, people are searching for something solid, something to set their feet on and breathe deeply. And thankfully, we have it. Jesus. Jesus is our rock-solid foundation and no matter what happens in this world, we have his unfailing love. And that's why I'm so excited to tell you about some generous donors who have offered a $125,000 challenge grant to help your financial gift go twice as far. That means when you give, twice as many people can hear about this foundation of our faith, the love that Jesus has for his people. Honestly, this has been a shockingly beautiful season for Time of Grace. We've been able to connect with more people, it feels like, than ever before. But there's still a significant cost in what we're doing. And producing these videos and getting this message out on so many different platforms isn't easy, which is why we're so grateful for you. So I want to challenge you this month to give that gift, which can go twice as far, so that twice as many people can know the rock that is our amazing God. To thank you for your generous financial support, we would love to send you two new and amazing books. The first one is a prayer journal called God Is Here. My favorite three words in the world. Filled with encouraging devotions and prayer prompts, I'm excited to use this in my own devotional life to connect with God in a fresh way. And there's also this book, Miserable Joy. It's by author Jason Nelson and it's how you can find joy in Jesus even if you're dealing with chronic pain. Request your copies when you give by calling 800-661-3311, visit timeofgrace.org, write us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin 53201, or text TIME to 313131 to give today. Time of Grace doesn't end here. We offer so much more. Visit us at timeofgrace.org. You'll discover resources to help you in your walk of faith. These include blogs, Grace Moments devotions, and our daily video devotionals. Connect with us on social media. Join our Facebook group where you'll meet a strong community of believers. Follow us on Instagram and get an inside look at our ministry. And if you need someone to pray for you, call us or submit a prayer request. Thank you so much for your support. We'll see you here again next week.